Luke was born and raised outside Denver, Colorado, and got his bachelor's degree from Colorado State University in 2015, where he studied biolog biological anthropology and geology. He's currently a graduate student in the biology department at the University of Washington, and he's in the process of completing his PhD. His research is focused on understanding mammal evolution during the age of the dinosaurs and right after the dinosaurs, uh, when they all, except for birds, went extinct. Welcome, Luke. All right. Um, thanks so much for having me, everybody. Um, excited to be here. I know a few people in the crowd, so hello to those of you that I know. Um, as Hamish mentioned, uh, I'm uh, currently finishing up my PhD at the University of Washington. So here's a nice, if you haven't seen the aerial view with the cherry blossoms in bloom, here you go. But, but yeah, so I've been here for um, just about six years now. And uh, most of my work has been studying, uh, trying to disentangle the early evolution of, of mammals. And so all of you, whether you know it or not, um, are very familiar with mammals. So your dog, your cat, um, you know, you, yourself, most of the kind of like the fuzzy, cuddly um, critters that you think of are all mammals. So I think I have a slide here just kind of giving you a um, a sense of the, the diversity of mammals um, that are around today. Yeah, so here you can see as far as the habitats they live in, um, kind of the way they make a living, they really run, you know, run the gamut from small little insectivores, um, like the guy, that weird tenrec in the upper right corner of your screen, uh, to flying mammals like bats, to fully aquatic swimming animals like whales, and then really bizarre things like armadillos and kangaroos, um, and then even us, um, our, uh, our pr primate lemur relatives over there on the left and then at the bottom right, uh, which my face might be covering, but that's uh, one of my favorite mammals uh, <laughs> there, uh, John Elway. But anyway, um, this is really what first got me interested in uh, mammals is just seeing how diverse they are today. And really, one of the main questions that my research is um, interested in tackling is where did this diversity come from and when did kind of these uh, mammal-like specializations like fur and lactation and social behavior um, and the way we grow up and develop, when did all these things um, occur? And really, when we think of mammals, we're looking mostly at a modern snapshot. So this little timeline that you're seeing here all of those pictures I was just showing you, those are all mammals that are alive today. And so today is really just the blink of an eye if we're talking about um, the geologic history of the earth. But when mammals first evolved, they evolved over 200 million years ago, way back in the age of dinosaurs. So that's the Mesozoic is what that time period is called. And the reason it's usually called the age of dinosaurs is because they're the really the big kind of charismatic um, animals that you see on the landscape, things like T-Rex and uh, Triceratops and the long neck dinosaurs like Apatosaurus and so on, um, were really the kind of the big animals that would have really caught your attention. But during that same time period, mammals were also evolving right alongside um, the dinosaurs. Mostly they were pretty small, but uh, what we're beginning to figure out more and more is they're actually pretty diverse. And so um, all of my kind of interest is focused on this uh, time of dinosaurs. What are mammals doing um, during the time of dinosaurs? And then what are they doing immediately after those big dinosaurs go extinct? And, all the, and basically all the dinosaurs that are left um, are the birds. So I think on the next screen, I can kind of show you where I do a lot of my work, um, which is mainly focused in what we call the Western interior of the United States. But um, really what, what that means is it's the states that you guys are all probably familiar with, um, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, um, parts of Nevada, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. This whole region of uh, the United States and even up into Canada and down into Mexico as well, you can see how, just how kind of barren and dry it is in the satellite view. So compare that to, you can see um, your guys' school is kind of lit up by that little sun up there um, near Seattle, how green and lush all that is. 
it makes for very beautiful hiking and, and stuff like that, but you're not going to find a lot of fossils because most of that rock is covered in, in vegetation and plants. Um, and also the rocks out there are, or in Seattle are pretty young. So most of the rocks that you find in that area, um, are only a few 10,000 or so years old, which seems like a long time, but in terms of the stuff that I'm interested in where you find dinosaurs, that's pretty young. So then if you pan back again to look at this Western interior, you can just see how dry and arid and kind of desert like a lot of that region is. And that's prime areas for finding, for finding fossils because it's in those really dry areas that the rocks that hold the fossils are exposed. And it's also the area where a lot of mountain building has happened that basically thrusts up a lot of those rocks to the surface. And then you can find the fossils weathering out um, of those old rocks. So this is kind of the, it's really one of the best places in the world, this little red box that's outlined here, one of the best places in the world for finding um, dinosaur fossils. And so for the, the six years that I've been up um, here in uh, the University of Washington, where I've been focusing a lot of my field work where I go out and collect fossils is right kind of where that little pink blob is um, around the Fort Peck Lake, which is really just the Missouri River um, that got dammed up. And um, this region of northeastern Montana is called the Hell Creek um, region. And it's become very famous because it preserves rocks from the very latest age of the dinosaurs. So the, the last known dinosaurs to have lived on, except for birds, to have lived on Earth. And then the immediate aftermath of after the dinosaurs go extinct. And in this area, you can actually walk up and point to the spot where we have evidence of an asteroid hitting the Earth and wiping out um, all of those big charismatic dinosaurs that you think of. And so this Hell Creek area where, where I've done a lot of my work, it first became really famous in the early 1900s when a guy named uh, Barnum Brown, who was working for the American Museum in New York City, came out here kind of exploring, looking for dinosaur fossils to put up in the, the American Museum in New York City. And what they found, what was kind of the crown jewel of what they found um, during this expedition, was actually the first T-Rex fossil that was ever discovered. So you're looking at it here. So this was probably in the early 1900s. And you can see some kind of school kids who are coming and admiring this really big, charismatic, big meat-eating dinosaur. And once this um, fossil was found, that really put the Hell Creek area of Montana on the map as far as this is a really good place to go and find fossils. And so for the last um, – well, so people since then, since the um, early 1900s, have been going out so almost 120 years – um, folks have been going out to this area, and the the lab group that I've been working with at the University of Washington has also been going and collecting fossils here. And it, and again, this is the age of dinosaurs, so we find lots of dinosaur fossils out there. And I think on this next slide, you'll see that um, a few years ago, um, myself, but mostly the rest of uh, the group that was that I was working with out in Montana, actually found a T. Rex skull. So this is me sitting um the skull is upside down um so i'm basically my hands are kind of resting on where the teeth would be pointing up at me um but this was a really big t-rex skull um that our group at the university of washington um and greg wilson mantia's lab excavated and so i i i had the fortune to to work there just for a day or two but there were crews there for the whole summer trying to get this skull um out of the ground we put it on big flatbed trucks and carried it all the way back to Seattle. And if you want to see it, it's already prepared and nicely displayed um, at the Burke Museum. And it's called the Tufts Love T-Rex. So that's the actual fossil there of that skull that I was sitting with my you know, arms kind of resting on top of. Um, and it, it turned out is one of the most well-preserved, uh, most like perfectly preserved uh, T-Rex fossils that had ever been found, or T-Rex skull fossils, I should say. Um, that had ever been found. So to give you a sense of the size, those each one of those uh, teeth is about the size of a big steak. If you've ever been to like an Outback Steakhouse, <laughs> it's about the size of one of those um, knives. So a really, really big animal. And we find all kinds of other um, dinosaurs out there. Um, again, these were some of the last dinosaurs that ever walked on Earth. 
we find th- things like um, Triceratops, which is the one that has the two big horns, the big frill in the back, um, and then the little nose horn. And that picture is me uh, with the Triceratops skull that some of our um, the folks who come out and do field work with us, they actually found um, one of the ranchers was flying by in his uh, like crop duster airplane, and he spotted that that skull coming out of the hillside in his airplane. And so what you're looking at there is there's right over kind of my right shoulder are two of the brow horns, the big horns that are kind of sticking back into the hill. And then right over kind of to the, just to the right of my head or to your left of my head is a little bit of that frill um, sticking out. So we just found that a couple years ago. And then to the right was, that was from my first summer um, going out into the Hell Creek area. And this is uh, what you're seeing in that rock that I'm leaning up against is the backbone of a thing called Thessalosaurus, which is a, a, a plant eating dinosaur that would walk on two legs, much smaller um, than Triceratops, but another one of those um, plant eating dinosaurs that would have been running around um, at this time. So lots of dinosaurs to, to be found, but this is really what I'm interested in. So for, for me, dinosaurs are a lot of work. And we, everyone's interested in dinosaurs, but for me, I think the most interesting things that we find in these same rocks are the tiny little mammal fossils. So that picture on your left, that's me with one of uh, the best uh, little jaws. So it's just, you know, you can kind of fill your, your chin bone here with all your teeth. Basically a little uh, lower jaw of a mammal that probably looks something like that thing that's below that picture. Um, it's called Oxyprimus. And you can see the kind of zoomed in picture, just how tiny that jaw is. And some little fragments that we had to glue back together later. But um, those tiny little mammals, that's what really holds the key to understanding where we came from, where your dog came from, where horses came from. All, all of the kind of early evolutionary history of mammals that we think of today, we're finding in these rocks. And another perk of uh, hunting for mammals is that if you look on the left there, that's the kind of work it takes to get a big dinosaur skeleton out of the ground. So we have to wrap everything in these plaster jackets. You have to reinforce it with these slabs of wood. Um, it's a real ordeal. We have to get landowners, local landowners come in with their tractors to lift it up. And then we have to use these guy wires to kind of uh, navigate things into the back of the truck. But then if you look on the right, a much more leisurely, uh, just you know, hanging out on the rock, picking up beautiful little mammal teeth, and you can leave the day on an outcrop with files full of fossils, some of them being mammals. Um, and it's much more, much easier to, to collect a lot of fossils um, rather than, you know, here we were only uh, picking up one chunk of that T-Rex skeleton and it took us um, almost the entire day to get that thing in the back of the truck. So that's another perk of uh, studying mammals. But what you end up with from all this work of picking at the outcrop and then we also take sediment out of the the rock itself and then kind of wash it almost like panning for gold and when we do that this is what we end up with so it probably doesn't look like much and it's probably a little bit blurry but what you're looking at there is almost uh probably on the order of 200 to 250 uh, mammal teeth so just isolated um little teeth and that's a one centimeter scale bar which is you know probably about my pinky nail in length and that whole over 250 um, fossils of mammals could probably fit in the palm of my hand pretty easily and that's what i work a lot with is um so they may not be as complete as you know that beautiful t-rex skull you found before but there's a lot more of them and what we can do with these fossils is we can start to reconstruct based on the shape of their teeth how abundant they are um, how many different species there are, so how diverse um, they are. We can start to reconstruct what these animals might have looked like, what they might have been eating, how they might have been moving around their landscape. So myself and many, many others before me and concurrent with me, um, we're starting to piece together just how diverse mammals were during the age of dinosaurs. And what we now can see is that they were occupying a lot of different habitats. So there's some good visuals here, I think, to just kind of summarize some of the ones that I think are really cool. So um, in the bottom left, um, you see this little critter that is burrowing. And we actually found evidence recently that it was um, potentially a social animal living in social groups. 
um, this critter in the top left um, was probably living in the trees and eating a diet of like bugs and plants. Um, this guy in the top right is one of the earliest primate ancestors who was probably eating mostly fruits. So this is one of our earliest descendants. And then we, uh, there's also been really cool findings like the thing in the bottom left, which is a carnivorous, um, mam- so meat eating mammal that lived at the same time as dinosaurs. They've actually found evidence of baby dinosaurs preserved in its stomach. So it was eating, it was preying on baby dinosaurs. So these weren't just tiny little insignificant little, um, things kind of scurrying under the foot of dinosaurs. There, there was a lot going on, um, with mammal evolution during this time. And so really that's kind of where, what really, you know, excites me about, uh, this research is trying to figure out what were mammals doing and how did that set the stage for what you see them, um, doing today. And with that, that's kind of my little spiel of what, um, I'm interested in and what I've been doing for, um, the last six plus years. Um, and yeah, I think we can open it up to questions if you have any. Okay. Yeah. Lots of questions. Uh, first one here is from Sydney. What is your most exciting or rarest fossil find? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my, my rarest fossil find that I ever had was probably actually before I started grad school. Um, and I was out in Wyoming and I was working on, um, rocks that were younger than the stuff I've been working on, um, for my PhD. These were about 55 million years old. Most of the stuff I work on now is 66 or so million years, if not older. Um, and I found this tiny little jaw that like you ha- I have to hold up to the screen. You could probably barely even see it, but is of a small, um, primate that probably could have, you know, curled up in the palm of my hand easily. And it was, and those are really, really rare to find in this area. Um, so as far as the rarest fossil that I've ever f- found that was, you know, it's like, oh, we never find those, you know, that kind of thing. That was probably the rarest one that I've ever found. Okay. Next one is, next. do you get sunburnt a lot? Yes. Yes. As, as you can probably see, I'm a very pale, um, human. And so I, yes, I get very, very sunburned. Um, or I, I should say I used to get very, very sunburned. And then I learned very quickly that, um, wearing hats and putting sunscreen on just about every hour and a half or two hours, um, helps that a lot. So it's gotten a lot better. Um, I don't get quite as sunburned as I used to, but still every once in a while, yeah, you can get really burned. It's the desert. It's the desert out there. So you're basically just cooking under the sun from the time you wake up in the morning till the time the sun sets at night. Question from Grace. Uh, why do T-Rex have sharp teeth? Yeah, good question. So, um, and what's even cooler, which I don't, you probably couldn't see in those pictures, if you look closely at the teeth, they have these little serrations on them. So these kind of like uh, jagged edges to them, just like you would see on a steak knife. Um, yeah, here you go. So um, on the kind of inside edges of those teeth, so you can see how it kind of curves back on that inside edge. There's those little serrations. Um, and that's for piercing and tearing, um, meat. So just in the same way you would use, um, you know, your steak knife to cut up a piece of meat or your parents would or whatever. The reason those serrations are there is because it can cut through that meat really easily. So that's why they have these big sharp teeth is because they were meat eating, um, dinosaurs and kind of a fun additional thing. You can also see they're pretty thick, so they're not really thin. So you think of your steak knife, it's very thin. Um, and that puzzled people for a long time of why does T-Rex have these, they're, they're sharp, but they're also very broad teeth. And some people think that that's because they were also crunching up hard objects like bone as well. So they would have not just, you know, torn the flesh off, like, like things like Velociraptor and things like that probably would have just been tearing the flesh off of a skeleton. Whereas T-Rex would probably just take a chunk and just chew the bone and meat and all, um, So yeah, so that's why it just eats a lot of meat (laughs) and bone too. Okay. Next one here is from Kelly. What tools do you use? Lots of different tools. Um, so my standard kind of when we go out is I have a thing, what we call a rock hammer. Um, so it just looks like a normal hammer, but you have a kind of pointy end 
uh, to kind of break into rock a little bit easier. We also use uh, big pickaxes um, for, you know, tearing down, especially if we have to do, you know, one of these dinosaur um, excavations or if we have to like expose a big rock face for um, like measuring and documenting the different rock types that are there. Um, I also use a thing called a, a Brunton compass. So it's a, a special compass to um, kind of measure what direction the rocks are tilting, what direction the uh, ancient water was flowing. So you can see that in some of the rocks, uh, they preserve kind of the flow of the water. Um, a hand lens so uh, or a loop, some people call it. So you'll see like jewelers who use those tiny little lenses to look at um, like diamonds or whatever. We use those all the time to look at either the tiny little fossils, so those mammal teeth you can't see with really barely with your naked eye. You have to have a little magnifying glass. Or the rocks themselves. Sometimes we'll take little rock samples and pulp them up in our hand and look at them. Um, and then other than that, you know, backpack, things like that. And then if we're talking about a, a, a dinosaur excavation, then we have things like backhoes, so those big, you know, heavy machinery to come and take off a lot of the overburden um, on the outcrop and, uh, the list goes on and on, uh, plaster for plastering up the, the jackets. But typically when I'm going out for a day, um, not knowing what I'm going to find, kind of just prospecting around a rock hammer, a pickaxe, a hand lens and a compass. From Sydney again, can you tell us about what your day is like when you're digging? Like, where do you stay? What do you eat? What's it like? Yeah. Um, so, so you saw earlier, we showed you the picture of that lake, um, that Fort Peck lake. We camp right on the banks of that lake. And so it's pretty nice. We're right on the, right on the water, um, but we're in tents. So we sleep in tents. Um, and then we have these big white cook tents um, that we set up. And that's where we like cook dinner, um, where we store our gear and things like that. And, uh, so, so yeah, so that's where we stay. And mostly what, as far as like what we eat, uh, you know, camp food. So a lot of pasta, chili, um, hamburgers, hot dogs, stuff like that. Sometimes we'll get crazy and make, um, you know, curry or something, but, uh, that's usually, um, kind of what we eat. And really the way it works is you wake up early in the morning, you wake up around, um, five 30 or 6 AM have your morning coffee, have a bowl of cereal, pack up your gear. And then we're usually on the road by about 7 a.m. We usually don't come back until about dinner time. And then we eat dinner and then we go out into the lake and then we wash all that sediment that we collected to find those tiny little fossils. Wash that out in the lake to kind of pan for gold, essentially, um, fossil gold. And then uh, then we usually play games in the evening. So if, the, if it's light enough, we'll play um, – like wiffle ball or kickball um, around camp, throw the frisbee around, um, and then when the sun goes down, we usually sit around the campfire, maybe play cards, and uh, and yeah, and then do it all over again in the morning. That's kind of the usual routine. Are there any dinosaur relatives on Earth now? Yeah, lots of them. Uh, you'll probably you've probably seen multiple of them today. I know. I was on a Zoom call um, earlier with my the rest of my lab mates at the University of Washington, and they were commenting all the bird chatter everywhere around us. So every little bird or big bird um, that you see, that is a direct descendant of dinosaurs. So they are dinosaurs. Um, kind of a fun fun fact you can you can tell your friends at, at the next uh, birthday party or, or when, wherever you're at is. Uh, T-Rex, that big, scary, toothy um, animal you saw earlier, is much more closely related to a pigeon or a blackbird than T-Rex is to Triceratops. So that group of animals, those meat-eating dinosaurs that walked on two legs, like T-Rex, Velociraptor, um, things like that, are the very close relatives of birds you see today. So birds are just one group of dinosaurs that survived that big extinction event. So they didn't all die off 66 million years ago. They went on to diversify um, just alongside the mammals um, after after that extinction event. So yeah, all the birds you see are dinosaurs. If you compare dinosaurs, are they mostly equal in size or different? That's from Nora. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of difference. 
so the ones we find most commonly are big just because they're very easy to find. So where we work, um, Triceratops is everywhere. And we get sick of finding Triceratops because we call them the cows of the Cretaceous. Because just like you, if you've ever been out to like Eastern Washington or any places more rural, and you see these big, you know, these herds of cattle that are everywhere, that's probably what Triceratops is doing. So we find them everywhere. Um, but you find tons of, of almost the whole range from very small to very large um, during this time period. So, for example, we found some evidence of little bird feathers um, in these little nodules, so tiny, tiny little dinosaurs. We find things that are kind of small to medium size, almost like a chicken or a little bit bigger, um, that are little meat-eating dinosaurs that are running around probably eating little mammals um, or bugs even. And then you find things that are kind of medium size, like uh, that critter I showed you that its backbone was in that rock. That is uh, kind of a more medium to large one. And then the really big ones are the ones you usually are thinking of, of T-Rex, Triceratops, um, Edmontosaurus, which is one of those duckbill um, dinosaurs. So really from very, very small to very, very, very large, um, they, they ran the whole kind of breadth. And one of the reasons people think that birds did so well during that extinction event is because when you have these big extinction events where a lot of things are dying, when times have gotten really bad, it's hard to get food. Um, the environment's not a good place to be. It's much better to be small. You don't need as many, you don't need as much food. You don't need as much shelter or it's easier to find shelter, I should say. Um, and so one of the reasons people think that birds might've survived, whereas the rest of the dinosaurs went extinct is because they were generally very small and, just like mammals, were also very small. So those two small groups happened to do very well um, during that extinction event, and it might have been because they're super tiny. I love these questions that are linking in with uh, previous talks we've had. Uh, do you know what wolves used to look like from Jessica? And Callie asks a similar question. Were they around in the time of the dinosaurs? Yeah, so wolves, um, they weren't um, around during the time of the dinosaurs. The, uh, the group that wolves belong to, that we belong to, um, that uh, horses belong to, most of the animals that aren't marsupials or um, the egg-laying mammals, the monotremes, um, their early relatives were around. Um, but anything like a wolf doesn't show up until much later. So we're talking about, and again, this is a very long time ago, but for for, for me, like things that are kind of related to wolves don't really start showing up until about uh, 40 or 35 um, million years ago. And then wolves themselves don't show up until um, probably five or so million years ago, maybe even less than that. So they're, they're newcomers on the evolutionary scene relative um, to most of the stuff that I look at, which is essentially the ancient ancestors, even the big group that they are all kind of encompassed um, within, but yeah, so and as far as what they look like when they, sh one of the things as paleontologists, we have, all we really have to go off of are the bones. And so based on their skulls, um, that's one of the reasons we know, oh, that's a wolf is because it looks very much like a wolf. So when you have things that are recognizable as wolves that are showing up in the fossil record, they probably looked like wolves. Um, and then things that were kind of the ancestor to them, probably looked like uh variations on dogs so think of the very like maybe coyotes or foxes and things like that was probably the precursors to wolves but once wolves show up more than likely they probably looked a lot like wolves a question uh did you have to study modern animals so you could better understand prehistoric animals that seems to link into what you were just talking about yeah that's a that's a great question and yeah, so a big part of my, my research and what I've done over the six years that I've uh, been at the University of Washington is actually going into um, the Burke Museum in their modern uh, mammalogy drawers and just pulling out skeletons upon skeletons upon skeletons of modern mammals and looking at them and trying to compare, okay, here's what we see in the fossils, here's what we see in the modern animals. We know a lot 
because we can watch modern animals on the landscape, you know, we can see how they're eating. We can see how they're kind of roaming around. Are they climbing trees? Are they burrowing? We can observe a lot of that behavior. And a lot of times that behavior um, through evolution is reflected in their skeletons. So their skeletons have to be adapted to, and their teeth have to be adapted to doing um, whatever they're doing to make their living. And so if we can say, okay, I saw that, you know, that monkey, it's climbing a tree, it's eating fruit. Here's what its skeleton looks like. Here's what its teeth look like. And then we see something similar in the fossils. We can say that thing has a very similar skeleton, has very similar teeth. It's probably doing something very similar to what that monkey that we can observe today is doing. And so that's a big part of my job is looking at things in the modern, seeing how modern behavior gets kind of recorded in their skeletons, in their teeth, and then applying that back, kind of what I learned from the modern, applying that to the fossil record to say something about what were these extinct animals that we can't observe, you know, roaming around the landscape, what were they doing? Um, so yeah, so that modern comparison is a huge part of what what I do and what just about every other paleontologist does, whether ma- whether studying mammals or dinosaurs, the relying on studying modern things is a big part of it. Okay, a dinosaur question here. Why did velociraptors have wings if they didn't fly? That's from Amelia. Ooh, you're getting outside of my expertise, but I can I can tell you my uh, my very uninformed uh, knowledge of what I know about it. So there's a lot of ideas for why dinosaurs got feathers and wings, but they couldn't fly. Um, so the feathers uh, in general a lot of people think was for um, uh, regulating their body temperature. So just like we have, you know, we have hair, but our, all of our ancestors had fur and that's mostly to kind of keep the heat in or be able to regulate, you know, your body temperature. Um, And so the idea with feathers is similar where they think that feathers might've first um, arose as a way to kind of keep your body temperature um, regulated. And so you don't get too hot or get too cold. Um, as far as the, the wings and kind of the elaboration on that, there's a few different ideas and I'm probably any dinosaur paleontologist who's watching this is probably rolling their eyes. But, uh, one idea is that it was for, um, agility. So if you can kind of create these wings to make you more aerodynamic when you're running, it can almost act as like an extra thrust, um, when you're running or climbing trees and things like that. Other people think that they might've been used for gliding. So if they could get up into a tree and kind of glide off of it using those, those wings. And then another school of thought is that it wasn't for kind of moving around at all. It was for display. So if you look at modern dinosaurs, the birds um, display to mates. So showing off those big colors, like the reason you see all these birds that have these wild colors, a lot of the reason for that is for finding mates and uh, attracting mates. And so one of the ideas is also that the wings were basically just a way to keep showing all these cool colors that you have and attract your mate of like, check out all my sweet feathers. Um, and so that's another idea. But um, again, this is not my expertise and, and there's probably a lot that I'm missing there, but those are the, the three that I've heard um, tossed around for why things started evolving um, wings in the first place or kind of these proto wings in the first place. And yeah, basically what birds did is they took something that was already there, these wing like structures on things like Velociraptor and so on. And then they're like, Hey, I can fly with this. And so they did that in, in much of the way that, you know, bats and things like that took, you know, the skin flaps you'll see on like flying squirrels and we're like, Hey, I can fly with this. So it was probably something similar, um, similar there, but not, not my expertise. So again, I apologize to any dinosaur paleontologists out there. <laughs> I'm going to have mercy on you and skip to a mammal question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> from, from Jessica. Do you know what horses looked like and from what animal they evolved? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, so horses are one of the most well understood um, evolutionary stories that we have of any other any other mammal, really any other living thing. So we have fossils going back at least five, 
55 million years that we can track a progression from these really tiny, they were, they were basically kind of like cat or small, like big cat or small dog sized critters that had uh, essentially three kind of hooks on the ground. And then they had two kind of little fingers that were starting to get reduced. And then uh, their teeth were pretty low crown. They actually, they look somewhat similar to, to our teeth probably. And then you can track how their teeth and their limbs changed to get essentially their teeth got taller and taller and taller to deal with grass and things like that. And then their limbs and their, uh, their hands got way, way longer until eventually they were just left with a single, uh, hoof, which is what they have today, which is the hoof is just their fingernail, basically their claw. And then all this is most of what you think of as like the horse's kind of lower leg. And then they have, you know, the rest of the body there or the rest of the arm and leg there. But that transition is one of the most uh, well-documented, um, in evolutionary history. And, um, if you Google horse evolution, you can find a lot of cool um, diagrams of that. But as far as the early, early, even before that, um, ancestors of horses, that little jaw that I showed you um, earlier that I was you know, laying down and was pointing my little poker um, at in the sand, that um, little critter is, is we, we call them archaic ungulates, which is a big word to basically say, most of the hooved animals, yeah, exactly. So most of the hooved animals, deer, horses, anything like that, probably all came from ancestors that look something like that little fuzzy guy in the bottom. So um, they show up right after the dinosaurs go extinct, and they're probably the early, early ancestors to all of the hooved animals that came after. So, so if you kept kind of tracing the evolutionary history of horses far enough back, you probably end up at something that looks like that furry little guy um, below there. And so that, that jaw um, that you're seeing there is a jaw of one of those um, very distant answers, not just to horses, but to anything that has a hoof that you see today, pigs, deer, um, anything like that. Um, I was saying earlier on how it's really easy or it's, it's relatively easy to see what a mammal was eating because as mammals, we have very unique differentiated teeth. Each one of the teeth in your jaw has a unique shape to it. And the different shapes of those teeth tells you a lot about what you're eating. But things like dinosaurs and other reptiles like lizards and snakes, they don't have that same sort of variation most of the time in their teeth. And so there's a lot fewer clues to say – what was this animal actually eating? And so once you get past this thing was eating meat, this thing was eating plants, it's actually a lot harder um, to figure out what, what dinosaurs and other reptiles were eating than it is for mammals that have those just really distinctive teeth that tell you so much about their diet. Um, But I will say there's a lot of people, um, a lot of paleontologists nowadays who are very interested in that question and they're using a lot of uh, fancy tools to basically um, map the shape of these teeth and compare it to other animals that had similar shaped teeth, like um, you know modern lizards and crocodiles and things like that. And then, in much the same way, I was saying I look at you know living mammals to understand extinct mammals. They're doing a similar thing there, um, but it's very much that's uh, it's more difficult, I'll say, in general. And as far as the defensive dinosaur thing. Um, I, th- I think that could have been two different questions. I don't want to leave it hanging. The first word dinosaur dinosaurs defensive. Most, a lot of them were trying to defend themselves from predators. So you think you have things with a lot of armor on them and, uh, and things like that, that made them, um, kind of hard to eat basically. Um, and then if the other part of that was correct is were they defensive as far as like going extinct, some of them were, and some of them were, Um, so like I said, the, those tiny birds that were probably eating like nuts and insects, they did really well after the big extinction event, but things that were really big, um, who relied on a ton of plant material or eating things that needed a ton of plant material, those things were not as defensive. So, um, so anyway, I tried to do the defensive question. I hope I got it. That sounds good to me. Uh, here's a question about museums. 
which I like. Uh, what, which museum has your favorite fossils? Oh, well. I, I don't feel contractually bound to mention any that yeah. <laughs> you're associated with. Well, so it's, it's, uh, it's a two-part answer. Uh, so my favorite fossil ever is uh, these little – it's a, a paper that my colleagues and I um, published fairly recently – um, on these little mammal skeletons. So I showed you most of what we find of these animals are just their little bitty teeth. So there's not much to go off of other than what we can say from their teeth. And, uh, some, uh, people that we work with found these beautiful skeletons of, uh, these tiny little mammals all huddled up together. And so it's in an area about this big, we have, uh, five individuals uh, almost full skeletons that are all kind of curled up together um, right next to each other. And that is just an amazing, amazing um, fossil. And I, yeah, I love that fossil so much. And it's currently at the University of Washington because we're still working um, on those fossils. Uh, myself and my advisor, um, Greg Wilson Mantia um, at the University of Washington. But so, so they're technically at the University of Washington and somewhat at the Burke Museum. But long term, where they'll be housed, um, kind of in perpetuity, will be at uh, the Museum of the Rockies, and that's in Bozeman, Montana, so western um, Montana. But yeah, those, that's that's my favorite fossil for sure. Okay, so the next one, I don't know whether it's a challenge for me to say or it's a throwdown to see if you know the answer. Uh, but do you know how the Pachycephalosaurus defended itself? Yeah, good question. Um, so I I only know um, a fair amount about these guys because some of our friends who come out and work with us out in uh, Montana are experts on civil source. And if any of them are listening, I'm I'm sorry because again I'm probably um, butchering this. But so they they're the ones with the big. For those of you who don't know, they're the ones with the big dome heads. They have the kind of like spikes through it. They almost have like a little crown of spikes around the edge. But they have, they're known for those big domed heads. And for a long time, people thought that they used them for headbutting. So uh, maybe like uh, like you see bighorn sheep headbutt um, today. Um, but what we know about them, as far as I know, is that they were they were really quick. They're really fast. Um, and so those those domes, it seems like they were more for display. So similar um, with what I was saying with like the bird feathers for you know displaying to other members of their species. Probably a similar thing with the domes. Um, they've actually shown that those domes probably couldn't handle much force. So that it's unlikely that they were like running at full speed and slamming their heads into each other. And so it might have just been another sort of display. Um, and so how they were um, of defending themselves against predators, they were just fast. They So they were built for speed. So just like you see, you know, deer – or um, antelope or anything like that that runs away from a cheetah or leopard, they just take off. Um, it's probably a very similar strategy of um, uh, evading, um, you know, kind of dodging them and, and running away rather than having anything that was like built into their body that could, you know, protect them. Thank you. That, that question was from Jason, I forgot to say. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> Grace asks, did you ever get to name a dinosaur or fossil and how did they get named? Yeah. Um, so I've never named a dinosaur because I don't, I don't study dinosaurs. Um, but I've named, um, a couple mammals. Um, I named one species of mammal, um, which was my first paper, um, that I ever wrote. And it was based on, it was this area in, um, kind of Southeastern, um, Idaho where, um, this gentleman, Bill Ackerson, um, did a bunch of work and he essentially found this area and found that it was full of these fossils. And so he was kind of the pioneer, uh, paleontologist who went there and realized there was a bunch of fossils there. And so we named a species after him. Um, and then, uh, more recently I described a, what's called a new genus. So it's just a little bit higher level than, a, than a species. Um, and, this was of those critters I was telling you about earlier that were um, multiple individuals that were all curled up um, in little uh, groups. And essentially through that paper, um, our, uh, 
what, what we think we found is that it's evidence of social behavior. So that these things were interacting in kind of social groups, much like you'd see um, like prairie dogs or something like that, um, where they live in these kind of like little colonies, perhaps. And um, because we uh, inferred that that's how they were behaving, we called it uh, thalicomies, which is so everything, all the scientific names are in general, either Greek or Latin that, that you name them after. And so flicomies in Greek means um, uh, neighborly or friendly mouse. So these things are really small, kind of mouse sized. Um, and if they were interacting groups, we were like, oh, neighborly friendly. So flicomies um, was one that I named too. Very cool. Question from Callie. Is the webbing between human fingers and toes related to other mammals? Yeah. Um, so I don't, once you get away from bones, I'm, I'm not, uh, as near of an expert, but, but certainly, I mean, most, if most, uh, uh, mammals have some amount of that kind of webbing in between and that gets, uh, it gets much bigger and more kind of pronounced in things that are aquatic things that are, you know, swimming through the water, it almost acts as like a paddle. So if you ever seen like an otter hand or something like that, they've got kind of more of that webbing to help them kind of paddle around. Um, so yeah, um, more or less it's there and it probably just gets uh, kind of, it gets bigger and more kind of prominent in things that are, that are using it more than we are, which it would probably just get in our way. So we don't have too much of it. Yeah. Not something you can really find in a fossil unless you're really, really lucky. Yeah, there are some fossils that preserve the skin, but as far as I know, there hasn't been very many where you preserve like a good handprint to where you could actually say how much of that, you know, that webbing is actually there. But Question from Grace. I'm going to widen out. She asks, what was the first recorded dinosaur find? I'm going to say prehistoric animal find of any kind. Yeah, no, that, so the, the earliest prehistoric animals and dinosaurs were almost certainly, um, native, native peoples. So, um, I, I'm not as familiar with, um, kind of the Asian and European, um, record. I'm much more familiar with the fossil record of, um, North America, especially, uh, especially the, uh, United States. And there are records of, um, indigenous peoples of, uh, the great plains. So that Western interior, that whole like red box we showed you right at the beginning, there, there were um, pe people have been living there for at least ten thousand, if not more. Uh, you know, probably closer to twenty thousand years. People have been living in that area, and just like you know, you or I could go, I could take any one of you who is watching this call out into that area of Montana where we work, and you would find fossils. I mean, it's impossible not to find fossils. And these are people who are way more um, kind of in touch with their landscape than we are today, where we're all sitting on our iPads or iPhones or whatever. Yeah. And so, so right here in this picture, you can see any, anyone who was living, any people who were living in this area for the last 20,000 years, they were certainly finding fossils and you see records of it, um, through the oral traditions of the indigenous peoples in these areas. And then when, um, when white settlers came over as well, they would kind of tell these stories about, um, these, these massive animals that they were finding in these areas. So, um, so it's hard to say when was the oldest one found because probably as soon as someone saw it, you know, <laughs> uh, they've, they've probably fossils have probably been known for a long time. Um, and, uh, it's, it's kind of a unfortunate thing that we, we lump the first finding into when did the, the white European, um, kind of colonist find it, um, which there, everything traces back to, you know, colonial times, essentially the 1700s or, or 1800s. But, um, but yeah, there's people have been finding uh, prehistoric animals for for millennia. Yeah, long before museums were there to uh, stick them in, in glass um, cases. Yep. Um, Sydney asks, uh, did you ever look for fossils or animals in ice? I never have. Um, so all the things that I'm interested in are really old. Um, you know, we're looking at. Um, the, the window of time that I'm interested in is from like about 180 to about uh, 
60 million years, that kind of window of time, which there's going to be no ice um, preserved that long. So most of the places, times you find things preserved in ice is more from the ice age. So things like woolly mammoth or um, ground sloths or dire wolves, um, and those are really, really recent. Um, so to, to give you like an idea, if I were to find fossils all accumulated in the same layer in this rock in Montana, they probably encompass more time that it took them to accumulate in that layer than all of those woolly mammoths and in us, our ancient ancestors took to find. So there's uh, the time scales that I'm working on is much, much more ancient that things that would be preserved in ice. So yeah, so this time scale gives you a sense. So today that, that yellow line that's marking today is probably like 15 times too thick to represent how little amount of time um, that actually represents in the grand scheme of things. So, um, so yeah, so I, ice is, is long gone. Um, and actually in the time period that I'm interested in, there was probably not much ice at all, even at the kind of the North and South poles. It was a very warm, um, time period in general. So yeah, not, not much ice, but, um, people do, people do find, you know, woolly mammoths and all kinds of cool things that are still preserved in the ice. Um, but that's because they're so recent. Back to uh, near the start of the pictures, uh, how long did it take to clean the tough love skull? A long time. Um, so in the field, that took um, probably close to three months to get it from where we found it to actually getting it to where we could put a plaster jacket um, on it to get it back to Seattle. So there's three months. And then um, getting it, we had to build it like this little – um, cage essentially like a, almost like a rotisserie chicken. We had to put it in this little cage. We had to build that, take the jacket off of it. And then they had to, now I'm going to forget how long it was, but it was probably close to two years. It took them to prep, um, that skull. And it's just sitting there with little micro drills and just slowly taking all that sandstone off. Cause you don't want to damage the fossil. So you have to go very slow. Um, but yeah, so probably, probably from, the time we found it to it being in the museum, even because then after you clean it, then you have to get it in the museum. So yeah, it, from start to finish, you're probably looking at about three years um, from finding it to having it on display in the museum. So patience is definitely one of the virtues of for being a paleontologist, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Everything takes longer than you think it's going to. <laughs> uh, question from Nora. Have you ever seen a dinosaur footprint? Or maybe a mammal footprint. I've never seen a mammal footprint. I hope to one day. Um, but yeah, I, I've actually seen a fair amount of dinosaur footprints. Um, the area um, that I worked before I went to grad school, um, there's this whole kind of ancient uh, shoreline. Basically, it would have been right on like a beach. And there's just, for as far as the eye can see, there's basically the rock just broke in such a way that it essentially preserved where the ancient surface would have been of that beach. And you can see all kinds of different footprints. Um, a lot of kind of the three toed footprints of things like, um, uh, those meat eating dinosaurs, like, uh, uh, we call them theropods, the bird relatives that have just like bird feet, kind of those three, three prong feet that go in. Uh, but then big kind of clunky things, things like sauropods, those long neck dinosaurs, and then kind of pudgy little feet of things like those uh, duckbill dinosaurs and things. So yeah, there's there's certain areas that are they're actually fairly common where you find these surfaces that just preserve all of these dinosaur footprints um, on top. Dinosaur Ridge is a really popular one um, that's right near Red Rocks in Colorado. If you've ever been over there, um, but yeah, so I, I've definitely seen dinosaur footprints. No mammal footprints yet. Fingers crossed. Uh, if uh, if you could see one extinct fossil alive as a mammal in front of you, which would you choose? Ooh. Uh, I would choose this thing um, that we call uh, uh, mazadma. So it's it's uh, basically it was it was really it was the most common mammal that was around 
right before the dinosaurs go extinct and then right after they go extinct. So in the we have in the in that area in the Hill Creek area of Montana, we have just so many fossils of Mazama. It's it um, when the dinosaurs go extinct, it's almost the only mammal fossils we find in the immediate aftermath of that extinction. So it's this very resilient animal that survived this huge disaster and, and it was just everywhere. And I would love to see because we we had this idea it was probably like a little rat like thing you know pretty generalized could kind of do everything but i would love to just like watch it behave and uh see like why was this thing so good at surviving um i would love to see mazadma back to dinosaurs is he <laughs> uh, I, do you know how parasophilus got their crest yeah so there's a lot of different dinosaurs that have like in that duckbill dinosaur kind of group that have some sort of crest. And there's been a lot, and again, I'm not an expert on this, um, but there's a lot of like hypotheses about why they had this crest. Some people think it was for making like noises so that it would kind of, you know, uh, amplify like, like hooting calls or kind of, you know, like uh, mating calls or something. Cause if you can think if you had, a big nose and you were to kind of like hum a tune out of it. Like if you had a bigger nose, you could make a lot more noise. Um, so that's one idea. I've heard other ideas that it was for um, keeping their, keeping cool. So if you have more kind of surface area, um, you're able to, so just like us, if we, you know, if you have more kind of skin exposed um, to the elements, you can kind of cool off easier. Um, so that's another idea, but I, I don't know what the um, kind of the current thinking on it is. Uh, I, yeah, I have, I have some friends who who study that, and I can I can ask them. <laughs> they could probably give you a, a much better answer than me. Well, we're getting close to the hour mark, so uh, I think there's just one last question here to tidy up, which is yeah. if someone finds a rare fossil on their own property, can they keep it? Yep. So in the United States, um, if you found a fossil on your private property, it's your property. Um, so you can keep it. Um, what we as scientists always say is, uh, it's always good to check with your local museum because it, a lot of times, you know, fossils are fairly common. Um, and so if it's something that's really common that we have a lot of, then we're more than happy to, you know, let you keep it. But there's a lot of times where people will find really rare and important specimens that if you just keep it at your house then it might as well be that that fossil doesn't exist um because if if other scientists don't know about it um then we can't learn anything from it so it's just kind of a cool thing that you have on your mantle where really why fossils are important is because they tell us something about um past worlds and past life um so so yeah so you can keep it but if you think it's something really cool check with your local museum and see if it'd be something that you'd be willing to loan to them. Um, it'd still be yours and you, your name would still be on it in the museum and everything. Um, but that would at least allow other scientists to, to study it and kind of keep kind of better understanding um, past worlds and, and past life. Okay. I think that's about it. Thank you so much. We've all learned a lot, a lot of uh, positive comments in the chat. So uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye.